everybody and uh, thanks very much for uh, joining us this morning for the um, press briefing for the spring 2024 quarterly economic commentary. We're, we're going to use the usual format today and uh, myself and Kieran will we'll talk through the main components of the uh, commentary in terms of the, the forecasts, the key indicators that we put forward every quarter. And we're also going to talk through some of the additional analytical material that we have in, in the commentary. If you uh, all get a chance to peruse through the document, you'll see there's quite a little, uh, quite a, a large amount of analytical content in this particular release. So we're, we're hoping to be able to summarize some of the key findings um, of those additional pieces of material uh, through the this uh, briefing, as, as well as giving the overall position. So obviously for the uh, spring 2024 commentary, it's the first time that we provide a forecast for 2025. So it also gives us uh, time to reflect on some of the uh, drivers that we think will take us into next year, as well as the outlook uh, for the present year. So let me start by kind of giving uh, the broader picture to talk and, and talk more generally about some of the factors that are, are are influencing the trajectory for the Irish economy for for this year and into to next year. Obviously, setting the scene coming into this year, we had the decline in GDP for last year for for twenty twenty three, and um, now obviously, as has been well documented by uh, by ourselves and others, there were very specific reasons for that, in particular around the performance of the traded sector and some of the multinational activities which led to a decline in exports and, and that uh, pulled down our GDP growth for, for last year by over 3%, so quite a substantial drop, but very specific reasons for that. Contrasting uh, to the traded sector performance is, again, the quite a moderate and, and quite uh, you know strong robust performance of the domestic economy, and this is this is a a story that we have been um, documenting for some time now. But again, it's it, it's reinforced in the figures uh, for last year. This kind of dual economy aspect, whereby we have a uh, one set of, of 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 indicators trending in a particular direction for the, the traded sector, and then we have uh, other indicators which we use for the the domestic economy. So if we uh, look at the uh, forecast table there, we, we've the three ind key indicators we have in our, our general uh, forecasts. We have the GDP, GNP, and we've modified domestic demand. To, just to, to recap, the modified domestic demand is the lens into the domestic economy, which captures consumption, government spending, and investment, and strips out from that investment forecast the, the activities specific to the multinationals or indeed and aircraft leasing activities which which often distort uh the the picture so what what have we uh got in general looking across that forecast table well uh for in gdp terms we're expecting positive growth for this year so a rebound from the decline uh last year what is driving that well we expect uh, a rebound in the traded sector so we expect export growth for for 2024 uh, we, we also expect uh, the domestic economy to, to grow into 24 and 25. So in general, this, this growth in GDP comes through both growth in the traded sector, but also growth in the domestic sector. You know, for, for, for 23, while there were specific Irish effects within uh, the forecast, which, which led to the outturn of a drop in, in exports, there were also global factors that were weighing on global trade and obviously a small open economy like Ireland gets affected by these these being the higher interest rate environment which was chasing that persistently high uh, inflation and also the the geopolitical tensions in particular at uh, those around uh, the the conflict in the Middle East which uh, kicked off towards the, the latter half of this year and we, we have some commentary on that in 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 the document the domestic economy, I think the best way to characterize what happened to it last year was that it it normalized at a steady pace of growth following a number of years of of repeated shocks and recovery from those repeated shocks. You know, it, it the the growth rate of the domestic economy, which I'll talk through in a few minutes, you can see it very clearly stabilizing. It dropped down a little bit towards the 
uh, toward, throughout last year, but it, it dropped down to a, a quite a stable level and, and a steady, robust level of, of, of uh, between two and three percent. And uh, in a sense, we're expecting that to continue uh, through our modified domestic demand forecast for this year and into next year. We have a, a small kick uh, to modified domestic demand for, for next year, and that's really coming through our expectation of lower inflation rates giving some boost to real incomes and also a, a path forward towards a reduction in interest rates, which should give a, a, a degree of upside uh, to, to economic activity. Again, I think uh, when we think of the domestic economy, we we, we know the, the labour market has, has performed relatively robustly, but but over and above that, uh, we also see the the drop in inflation uh, for this year giving and, and into next year giving some space towards real income uh, return to real income growth, which which is uh, which is important. I guess the the uh, there are some good indicators which allow us to get a better handle on the the overall trends. Uh, you know, from the CSO now, if you look at the the left hand chart here, you see the growth rate of GDP and GNP. And if we focus in on the, the blue line, which is the GDP forecast, you can very clearly see throughout last year and, and a starting at the end of 2022, it's a very clear downward trend in GDP growth you know, towards those negative figures, which pulled down the overall uh, annual uh, rate. But then when we move to split that out between foreign dominated sectors and, and domestic dominated sectors, this is uh, the difference between the red line, which is the foreign domestic uh, sectors, and the green line on the right-hand chart, you can very clearly see that the major decline was coming through the foreign dominated sectors. And then the green line, which is the domestic dominated sectors, had that much more stable path forward. Some moderation uh, throughout 2023, but moderating at a, a kind of long-term uh, you know, structural growth rate of, of in and around two to three percent. So much more moderated pace of growth. And um, so in a sense, the best way to characterize that is is a steadying of the growth rate uh, and at a at a at a moderate but reasonably robust uh, level. You know, one of one of the elements uh, that we we always try and do is to un unpick specifically what's happening across the the various components of the economy. And the chart here uh, on the right hand side breaks out the GDP developments in 2022 and 2023 across the various components of of uh, of of GDP. So we've got domestic consumption, we've got government spending, we've got investment, and we've got the traded sector, so imports and, and exports. And the little uh, dots represent the year on year growth for 2023, and the bars then are for are the year on year growth for 2022. And what's nice about a chart like this is that if the dots are lower than the bars, that shows your your direction of travel. So in a sense, if your dots are lower than your bars, your your growth rate is coming down from where it was before. So what we can see very clearly here is that consumption grew a lot slower. Uh, in 23 relative to 22, but that was because we were coming out of the pandemic and that huge volatility we experienced in, in 22, similar for, for government spending. And if we then contrast that across to the export side, you can see a, a, the exports are coming down by, by uh, nearly 5% uh, for the full year and uh, 23, and that was much, much slower than, than, than 23. So what, what we got, uh, a very good picture here is the contrasting uh, performance of the various components uh, of the economy. Um, the investment picture is interesting. Towards the end of last year, we got a little bit of a kick, which pulled us up in, in overall terms uh, for investment. But what we, we'll talk through in a couple of slides is that if you break that down across the components of investment and you look at the modified investment, there was a, a drop in nearly all groups of investment. Uh, or the asset classes, except for uh, residential dwellings, and there are a number of factors that are that are weighing on that, which we will, which we will talk through in detail. But again, a nice contrast across the 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 picture. One of the elements that we've included for uh, quite a number of commentaries now is our now cast for modified domestic demand. So this is a real time indicator that we publish on a monthly basis, and it gives us a lens into what's happening uh, to the domestic economy um, be before some of the 
the detailed uh, information is published in the national accounts, etc. And actually, what we saw for last year uh, was 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 quite a a muted picture for for modified domestic demand. But there are very specific reasons for that. One of the, them being the um, the drag that investment had on the modified domestic demand even with the adjustments that are made from taking out some of the multinational activities investment was was weighing on the on the the modified domestic demand indicator why was that well there were some specific reasons uh th that there was a, a base effect from very high investment in 2022 but also there were a number of of the you know the global conditions the higher interest rates would have pulled down investment uh, relative to to the previous year but the base effects were were, were also important we we have uh, you can see from the chart here um, throughout last year, our nowcast, uh, there, there was a, a big difference between what the nowcast was saying in terms of the trajectory and what the actual outturn was, and that was mainly these investment effects. And there's a, a, a box in our commentary by our colleague Paul Egan, which explains this uh, divergence between the domestic and the the uh, the 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 domestic indicators from the nowcast and from the actual data and this being uh, the the drag that this these specific investment effects had on on the the mdd nowcast in terms of of uh consumption obviously this is one of the most important indicators uh, of the domestic economy it and the labor market are certainly to me uh the two indicators that are give us our best lens as to what's happening uh, on the ground for the economy, because obviously these aren't affected specifically by multinational activity. And, and what we can very clearly see uh, throughout uh, 2023 was a moderation in, in consumption expenditure. So obviously the very high levels of inflation in, in 22 and 23 were eroding real incomes. These were having a moderating effect on consumption expenditure. But we still did have this effect until the end of last year, where the savings ratio had been higher than its its historical norms. And what did that do? Well, obviously, uh, the the higher savings allowed households to maybe buffer some of those uh, price effects and to give the overall uh, consumption uh, expenditure uh, a an upside kick relative to what would have been the case without those higher savings levels. Now. For this year and into next year, uh, it is our uh, baseline expectation that those savings ratios have come back to the more normalized levels. We saw that in the, the uh, data from the CSO towards the end of last year. So it is our expectation that those uh, reductions in the savings ratios have occurred and therefore there, there isn't a major upside uh, push to consumption from those, uh, from those data. So for, for this year, we're expecting consumption growth Two and a half percent, and then a small kick next year. Why are we we expecting a small kick next year? Well, there's two main effects of that. One, if inflation is coming down and real incomes are rising, that should give an an, an additional stimulus, a small additional stimulus. And second of all, we are expecting that there will be a, a path towards more uh, interest rate moderation towards the end of this year into next year. And that should also be supportive of both domestic activity, but also you know there will be that should give a, a broader international kick, which can pass through uh, domestically. The um, charts here, one provides information on the retail sales, which you saw kind of slow throughout last year. And and uh, the slowdown has kind of continued into, in, into this year in, in line with the moderation. But it's quite interesting if you look at the chart uh, below that, which looks at Ireland relative to a bunch of other European uh, Union countries, Actually, we had the strongest consumption growth last year relative to uh, the basket of countries we presented there. And, you know, that is a quite a robust uh, uh, finding and, and indicator for the Irish economy. And therefore, the moderation we're seeing needs to be in, into kind of more steady consumption growth needs to be seen in particular in that context. So coming down towards the, the two to two and a half percent growth rate is is still high in an international context at present, given the challenges some of the other European countries uh, have been facing. In in terms of the traded side, obviously I've, I've, I've pointed out that this was where the weakness came through in, in 2023. And, and specifically, 
you know, what has happened there? Well, actually, if you look at the top chart on the right hand side here, this kind of gives you the lens into to what has happened. The red bars here are the uh, the year in year growth in, in 2023. And where has it slipped? Well, it slipped through the, the good side and it slipped both through the international trade. So that's the real physical movement of goods across the border. But it also has slipped quite quite dramatically in terms of the globalization activity. So this is the contract manufacturing, the chanting, the kind of uh, the, the activities that are are not necessarily goods flowing across the Irish border. So that has been one of the reasons why um, the, the, the goods side has been down. But over and above that, there has been some slippage in terms of the uh, pharmaceutical in particular, but on, on, on the goods side, which is weighing on our exports for way down our exports for, for 23. Quite interestingly, uh, the service uh, sector still posted strong growth last year. And in particular, the computer services, which is a very large component of our exports, grew very strongly last year. And that that is, is quite a robust signal for the Irish economy and, and for our role in, in uh, the ICT, the global ICT infrastructure, given that the ICT sector had its own challenges um, into uh, in, into last year, we still had very robust growth in ser in uh, computer services exports uh, for for twenty twenty three. And um, one one point to note for our outlooks, we are expecting a return to growth in for for exports for twenty four and into twenty five, in line with global trade uh, forecasts uh, from international forecasters who are expecting a, a pickup in. You know, a moderate pickup in 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 world trade uh, for this year and next year relative to our expectations uh, in in the pre pre uh, Christmas period. One point that's also interesting to note um, for Ireland's role within that is is when you look at the chart below and looking at the value of Irish exports, uh, there was a recovery in some of the areas that had been sluggish, in particular the pharma in the first month of this year relative to the first month of last year. So there is some, there are some signals that the, the pharmaceutical sector is, is picking up a little bit into, into the present year. In terms of the, the broader global economic outlook, you know, really important uh, for a small open economy like Ireland. I think we have a box in the commentary which goes into it in, in, in detail. But uh, the, the, if you look at some of the international forecasters, the IMF in particular, their expectations are a little bit more positive uh, at the current junction than they were at the end of last year. But there are a number of notable headwinds. And, you know, we the, the big one that emerged towards the end of last year was the uh, destabilizing effect of the conflict in, in the Middle East. And I think this chart here shows it in, in, in great detail. This is basically uh, the uh, the trade activities at, at key shipping points around the globe. And what you can very uh, clearly see here is that activity in the, the Suez Canal was down notably into this year and that it uh, it, it was being, uh, shipping was being rerouted around the Cape of Good Hope. So there are international effects on global shipping and, and global trade from these uh, from the, the regional conflict in the Middle East. And this could weigh uh, on the global outlook. You know, it's already raised uh, international freight prices, for example, uh, since October. So this is a, a downside risk in terms of the, the global economic outlook. So with that, I'll hand over to Kieran to talk through uh, the rest of the, the briefing. Thanks, Connor. Um, on investment, um, so investment remains muted. So in, in 2023, again, we had the difference between kind of underlying and headline investment. Uh, overall, headline investment grew in 2023, but the underlying picture, uh, as given by modified investment, was was quite negative. We saw a fall off of uh, over 7%. Um, a number of different reasons for that. Um, uh, you know, some of them were to do with base effects from investment levels uh, in 2022, which were particularly high. Um, uh, but some of it was driven by things like non-construction investment, and even within uh, construction, we saw uh, kind of countervailing forces at play. So on the one hand, we see the residential market uh, continuing to see an increase in investment, but in terms of um, uh, commercial investment we do see a slowing uh, very definitely as far as uh, that sector is concerned. 
going forward, we expect to see, uh, you know, pick up in, in both headline and, and underlying investment this year and next year. And that reflects the fact that, as I said, some of the downturn last year was due to, to base effects. Um, but also, uh, as particularly as we move through this year and into the next year, we will expect to see uh, an easing uh, of the monetary policy stance by central banks, which should uh, lead to lower, lower interest rates and hence have a positive effect as far as uh, investment is concerned. And also, Connor alluded to, uh, you know, the improving kind of global position uh, there in, 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 the, in the last couple of slides. Um, we have a, a, quite a few boxes, actually, in, in the commentary. Connor has talked about uh, two of them so far. Uh, our former colleague, John Fitzgerald, has done quite a bit of work again, looking at the underlying pace of growth in the economy and working out exactly how fast and how uh, dynamic the Irish economy has been performing over the last 10 years. So what we do uh, in another box is we take that underlying pace of growth and we look at what the headline or we look at what the investment uh, share of output is. Uh, this is an important indicator in terms of over, over you know, general investment levels in the economy. Uh, and what we show is that when you use that, uh, you know, underlying growth rate uh, and combine it with investment, you see that the, uh, the the true picture as far as the investment share is quite a bit more modest, if you like, uh, than what the headline investment share would suggest. So the headline investment share is very often influenced and duly influenced by elements within investment that are influenced by multinationals. Um, but when you combine an underlying investment level with the true pace of growth in the economy, you get the following picture as far as the underlying investment share is concerned. And I suppose what this points to is, again, this need, uh, acknowledged need, which we'll talk about at the end, uh, for greater investment in the domestic economy, um, given the pace of growth that we've experienced over the last, uh, last 10 years. As far as housing is concerned, uh, in terms of investment levels, what we've seen uh, we have seen a pickup in housing investment in the last year or two. Um, so we had 29,000 units in 2022, um, up to just under 33,000 units in, in 2023. At this point in time, it does look that we'll, uh, like on the basis of commencements, that we'll probably get something near enough to 33,000 units again this year. Um, so that will be a little bit disappointing in terms of we would expect a, a greater bounce if you like, uh, in, in, in terms of supply levels and also cognizant of the fact that we will have revised estimates out as far as the structural demand is concerned. And so therefore, you know, it's clear that we still need to build more housing units than what we are actually building at present. So we do expect to see somewhat similar output levels this year. Uh, we will expect to see a moderate increase again next year. And again, that reflects the general overall uh, more beneficial outlook, if you like, as far as investment is concerned, i.e. with lower, in, uh, lower interest rates. Um, another box that we look at, uh, that we have in the commentary, looks at the whole issue of uh, under-occupied dwellings uh, in Ireland and compares them with the EU. This is based off work that uh, Eurostat have done recently, uh, and we, we just do a box drawing out the various different uh, elements. It's by our colleague, uh, Leah Hauser. Um, in terms of drawing out um, certain trends as far as the Irish market is concerned. And I suppose what's noticeable as far as the Irish housing market is concerned is how high our under-occupancy rate is. So in Ireland, we have a rate at around 67%, uh, whereas the EU average is 33%. Under-occupancy, by the way, is defined as a household uh, is under-occupied if it has at its disposal more than a minimum number of rooms considered adequate. Uh, now, the exact definition is in the box in the in the commentary, but what you can see is that Ireland has a particularly high rate of under-occupancy. Uh, and in general, what that means is that we generally tend to have a higher share of houses and a smaller share of apartments compared to continental Europe. Uh, and as a result, um, this is why we have such a, such a high uh, rate of under-occupancy in this context. Um, it does, I suppose, point to where we go from here in terms of meeting the housing needs, uh, it's clear that we need, on average, smaller units uh, compared to what we typically historically have had in order to meet the kind of demand that, that that's out there that I just talked about in terms of the structural demand. So I think it's a very interesting uh, set of results there in terms of where the Irish housing market is at compared to uh, other countries. Um, if we go on to just look at the, the inflation situation, clearly it's moderating. And you see that our forecast for this year at 2.3% for the CPI is down considerably on where the CPI was last year. And we, again, we expect it to moderate further into 2025. 
Uh, it's clear that the energy price element has has really been diminishing over the past period of time, but we're seeing it the uh, inflationary pressures coming through more in areas like restaurants and hotels and food and beverages, etc. Uh, mortgage interest rates, which have been a big driver of inflation um, in terms of their impact on CPI, uh, though you know that interest rate dynamic is set to abate as we move through this year and into next year. Um, So whilst interest rates can negatively affect inflation by reducing demand, because in in a mathematical sense, because of the way in which uh, the CPI is calculated, the way in which housing costs are incorporated, it does mean that when you get an initial increase in interest rates, that actually feeds through into a higher rate of inflation. So that dynamic will begin to uh, ease as as we move through the year and into next year. Um, we do avail of um, some new data that the U- ECB, the European Central Bank, um, in terms of their consumer expectation survey, they have added Ireland to the mix. Um, so they have results for Ireland in terms of both house price expectations and in terms of general inflation expectations. Uh, we think these are quite interesting. Um, what they show is that Irish people expect inflation very much to come down in terms of their expectations for the rest of this year. Um, however, it, because those some of those inflation expectations are, are generated last year, um, they're still relatively high. So they're still expecting inflation rates of above 4%, for example, uh, for the rest of this year. Uh, and that reflects the fact, as I said, that some of those expectations were generated last year. But you are, as you come towards the end of 2023, you see that people's expectations for the year ahead, uh, you can see the inflation rate coming down to like 3.5%. Uh, and so, obviously, if if you were to look at if if people were generating those expectations now, uh, it, that inflation rate would be even lower again. So it, it it's picking up the kind of diminishing or the uh, consumers' expectations that that inflation rates are set to decline quite significantly over the next period of 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 time. Um, if we go on to look at the labour market, what we see again is this uh, concurring trend of the unemployment rates is uh, declining after we did have that adjustment uh, last summer. Uh, a kind of a statistical adjustment by the CSO in terms of how the unemployment rate was calculated. We saw quite a f- uh, number of Ukrainians being added, if you like, into the the unemployment levels, uh, and that caused the rate to bump up to around 4.5%. It has been coming down quite significantly since, and our expectation is that that will continue to happen, uh, continue to occur this year and into next year. Uh, you are seeing the job vacancies beginning to, to decline there. You see the blue line in the graph. So um, that is coming down from very, very high historical uh, uh, levels or rates uh, after COVID-19. But, um, you know, you are still seeing uh, quite a significant amount of employment growth in the economy. Um, We expect real earnings to uh, uh, experience positive growth this year. That'll be the first time for a number of years. And again, that kind of helps to complement our overall assessment as to where the economy is going. So you've had negative real growth in wages over the last number of years because of the high inflation rate. But because you have inflation coming down, given uh, our kind of expectations around nominal wage growth, that means that households for the first time in a couple of years will have real wage growth this year. So between that, between households experiencing that this year and into next year means that there'll be quite a a positive dynamic uh, as far as the overall growth situation in the economy is concerned. On the public finances, again, we continue to see good news there. So we we are forecasting quite substantial uh, surpluses this year and next year. Um, We do continue to see corporation taxes, I mean, grew last year. That was a little bit of a surprise. Most people were expecting corporation tax receipts probably to come back a bit last year on top of the very substantial increases in 2022. So the overall increase last year uh, was welcome. Um, It was obviously a lower rate of growth than what uh, corporation taxes had witnessed over the last number of years. But, you know, the the, the increase that was experienced in 2022 and 2021 was exceptional and unlikely to be uh, replicated. So, uh, you know, we expect modest, very modest increases in corporation taxes this year. We do expect increases in the other areas of, of, of government exchequer receipts. And so overall, that means we have a, a, you know, a very positive and healthy picture from a fiscal perspective. There are vulnerabilities there, clearly, as far as the corporation tax receipts are concerned in terms of the concentration uh, of those receipts in a relatively small number of firms. But overall, uh, the picture is is quite a positive one and, and clearly has positive effects then in terms of the key metrics, fiscal metrics like debt to GDP or debt to GNI star, both of which are continuing to follow a downward trajectory uh, as they have really over the last uh, seven or eight, possibly nine or 10 years. 
So overall, then our assessment, um, you know, again, this issue of headline GDP underestimating domestic economic performance. We saw that particularly last year in 2023 uh, because, you know, it didn't capture really the underlying dynamic in, in, in the economy. This year, we do expect GDP to pick up uh, and experience positive growth. Uh, however, you know, we've outlined the risks that are there as far as uh, internationally is concerned. Uh, in terms of more underlying pace of growth, uh, as captured particularly by modified domestic demand, we expect that to grow again quite uh, consistently this year and into next year. Um, in a box which Connor alluded to, we actually do note that modified domestic demand itself may even be subject to certain issues around as far as multinationals are concerned, particularly because the modified investment component uh, does and can be influenced as well by certain multinational transactions. So even modified domestic demand is maybe possibly capturing the full extent of how quickly the economy is performing and growing. Uh, public finances continue to be in a strong position with strong growth in income and VAT. Um, but clearly the, the key challenge, and this is uh, underscored, I suppose, by our recent contributions in terms of looking at the National Development Plan, the revision that we did or the revised S uh, assessment we did of it uh, released in January, uh, with other colleagues, which show that, you know, clearly the economy is facing significant infrastructure uh, challenges and investment uh, challenges over the coming years. You know, the investment share estimate that we have clearly shows that it is quite low for an economy that's growing as rapidly as Ireland's. And so really the challenge is how to address those infrastructure bo bottlenecks uh, in the context of, uh, you know, a relatively constrained labour market where you have unemployment at, relatively speaking, uh, historically low rates.